If you can't get enough supply chain, join us in Orlando for GS1 Connect, one of the leading supply chain conferences where you can connect with colleagues, interact with industry experts, tap into the latest best practices, and discover how to use data most efficiently to optimize your operations and grow your business. Be one of our over 200 attending companies and engage with over 120 speakers and over 20 trading partner roundtables to expand your knowledge on supply chain management best practices. Check out the agenda to learn more about our keynote speakers and sessions. We hope to see you there. When I joined the FDA, I literally got thrown into the fire right away. And being new to the agency, but with a lot of traceability experience, I figured, all right, this is my moment. This will be a piece of cake. My eyes were opened. And when you're doing traceability from the agency perspective, it's real. People are really getting sick. And the documentation that you get from industry is all over the map. Because at the time, there was no sortable spreadsheet requirement. There was no CTEs and KDEs. It's, hey, send us your records. You don't get nice, neat G10 lot, SSCC, ship to, ship from. You don't get any of that. And when you're under the gun and you're trying to solve a food safety problem, people are really getting sick. It's a lot of pressure. And every day that you're struggling with paperwork, trying to get into spreadsheets, trying to figure out the source, you know people are getting sick. So it's a lot different pressure. Hello and welcome to the Next Level Supply Chain with GS1 US, a podcast in which we explore the mind-bending world of global supply chains, covering topics such as automation, innovation, unique identity, and more. I'm your co-host, Reed. And I'm Liz. And welcome to the show. Reed and I just had the pleasure of speaking with Andy Kennedy from New Era Partners. He has been around the food industry for many, many years, and he shared with us what food safety means and why it's important for both retailers and consumers. There's a food safety regulation. Specifically, it's called FISMA 204, so Food Safety Modernization Act 204, where the supply chain has to take some actions that they hadn't necessarily done in the past. He talks about the importance of standards and traceability when it comes to food safety and how utilizing GS1 standards can help comply with this evolving regulatory demands. And he illustrated how technology really has progressed over the two decades. He took us a little bit behind the scenes of what happens when foods get recalled, which is really interesting. And that the pandemic, while we don't really like to talk about it all the time anymore, it's highlighted the need for resilience, real-time visibility, and interoperability in supply chains. Enjoy. Andy, welcome to the show. We are so excited to have you today. Thanks, Liz. Just a thank you to Liz, Andy. I don't get any love. I mean, come on. No, Reed. Absolutely not. (laughs) It's the way it should be. That's the way it should be. So you are very well versed in all things food safety. And that's kind of going to be the theme of our conversation today. Before we get started, will you just give us a little background of yourself, what you've done in the food industry and not food industry, if that applies, and then what you're doing now to move all of this food safety stuff forward? That's a pretty big question. So I've been doing this for a while, as you can imagine. So I've been in the traceability space for about 17 years. So I started in 2006, creating really one of the first SaaS food traceability businesses, Food Logic. You got to put yourself back in time. 2006, that was before the iPhone. So doing traceability was kind of a pain back in the day. So It took a little while to get that rolling. So we've been through the traceability wars for a long time, but I was fortunate enough to get some great customers early on, Whole Foods and Chipotle, and really got to understand how traceability works in real life at scale, you know, across some big supply chains. And then concurrently, while we were doing that, I was asked by GS1 to help out with adapting EPCIS to the food world. Serialization in the food world didn't go over really well, so... I can only Um, imagine. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Really identifying every case kind of didn't work for food. So I had the pleasure of working with Ken Traub on updating EPCIS to include the famous LG10 or G10 plus lot. So that was EPCIS 1.1 and 1.2. So working with Ken and Gina Morgan on really taking EPCIS and adapting it to the food world. So it was amazing. Tremendous experience working on that technology. 
and adapting it to batch lot traceability. So that was the beginning of my GS1 journey, my first real big working group experience. And, you know, if I didn't have enough bureaucracy doing that, I was asked to participate in the FDA pilot with IFT. So when FDA was test driving FISMA 204, just trying to understand what the industry was doing. So IFT ran a pilot project and FoodLogic was invited to be one of the 10 participants in that pilot. And that's where I really learned about traceability from an FDA perspective, like their use cases. So that was incredibly eye-opening. And I built a relationship with IFT so when Tejas Bot left IFT to go to Walmart and pursue blockchain traceability, working with Frank Giannis over at Walmart when he was VP of food safety, developing traceability for Walmart, I subbed in to the Global Food Traceability Center and had the opportunity to work with GFTC on seafood traceability, which was incredible. So working globally on seafood traceability standards, and we went everywhere. We did events all around the world for a couple of years, developing those best practices and standards. And at their core, we adapted EPCIS for interoperability for seafood, which was amazing. So I got to take all that work that we had done back in the day with 1.1 and 1.2 and really apply it to the seafood use case. So at the GFTC, Frank was one of the advisors. We got to know each other, done some panels and so forth together. And then when he went to the FDA and joined FDA in 2018, not long afterwards, he signed the consent decree for FISMA 204 to really, you know, the rule have been on the books for almost 10 years and consumer groups were very interested in getting the rule out there into the world. I joined FDA in the fall of 2019. And I don't know if you remember back then, but there was a little thing called COVID that happened right after that. So I had all these visions of working in FDA and White Oak and getting suited and booted every day and have my awesome apartment up in Silver Spring. That lasted exactly four months. Then I ended up back at home in North Carolina, sitting in my sweatpants on working group calls with the rule writing team for the next three years, which was great. The team that developed the rule was incredible, had the opportunity to do comment responses after the proposed rule. So I got to read thousands of comment responses and read, I know this is going to surprise you, but there are several people out there that aren't fans of the federal government. So I, I'm shocked. I'm shocked. So you've dropped a couple of names here and I don't want to put any pressure on anybody, but Frank Giannis is our number one podcast right now. He was so important that we got stiff armed by our CEO, Bob Carpenter. And he's like, Liz Reed, you're not on the podcast today. I am going to be interviewing Frank Giannis. And in all seriousness, it was a great conversation. Then Gina Morgan, you dropped her name as well in a lot of the EPCIS work. So she was on just a couple of months ago and hers actually started trending higher. So any, no pressure today oh my gosh. for the three of us. Okay. <laughs> no pressure for the three of us to keep building upon this. I know Liz. You had another piece to that, though, and I just got so excited yeah. about this. Like, there's so much. There's so much stuff, and there's so much technology, Andy, that you've helped, like, to enable all of this traceability. But underlying that is food safety for consumers and retailers to get safe food and food service outlets, right? What does that mean to you? Because all of this work you've done over all of these years, it comes down to the importance of food safety. Yeah, so great question, Liz. And when I joined the FDA, so that was October of 2019, within like the first week, we had a massive outbreak investigation related to romaine lettuce. So I literally got thrown into the fire right away. And being new to the agency, but with a lot of traceability experience, I figured, all right, this is my moment. This will be a piece of cake. My eyes were opened. And when you're doing traceability from the agency perspective, it's real. People are really getting sick. And the documentation that you get from industry is all over the map. Because at the time, there was no sortable spreadsheet requirement. There was no CTEs and KDEs. You're talking the BT Act of 2002. It's, hey, send us your records. So you get POs and invoices, bills of lading. You don't get nice, neat G10 lot, SSCC ship to, ship from, you don't get any of that. You get literally handwritten documents, scribbles and things like that. And when you're under the gun and you're trying to solve a food safety problem, people are really getting sick. 
it's a lot of pressure. And I hadn't really experienced that pressure until that first outbreak. And every day that you're struggling with paperwork, trying to get into spreadsheets, trying to figure out the source, you know people are getting sick. So it's a lot different pressure, much different than being a solution provider, even different than being one of the people that supply food, because you're just part of a big ecosystem. It may not be your product, but when you're the one trying to figure it out, every day that goes by, the industry wants to know, what have you found out? Which food item is it? Or where did it come from? So I got to feel that real life and how closely connected food safety, foodborne illness, and traceability are to each other when things go wrong. Yeah, and I got to imagine, and please give us a little more insight into that. Like when that outbreak happened, I mean, these aren't like, hey, Andy, what's the update for this week? It's Andy, what's the update for this hour? Calls in the morning, calls at lunch, calls in the evening type of thing. Is that the way it goes? Shed a little light on that. Especially where I was new to the agency, I was working every weekend. It was just plowing through data. So I was the new kid on the block. So I got piled up with a whole bunch of things to go through. Yeah, it's daily calls with the team. It's update calls with state and local agencies. And you wouldn't believe how many people are involved in these outbreak investigations. I mean, the calls are massive. Because on a multi-state outbreak, you're dealing with each state agency, you're dealing with local inspectors, you're dealing with the food companies, and it could be dozens and dozens of locations that you're dealing with, multiple retailers, restaurant operators, food production companies. So you can imagine all of this has to get put together in a matter of hours. So getting everyone's contact, getting in touch with everyone, set up the call, set up the team. It's incredible the amount of work that goes into one of these outbreak investigations. And it's all got to happen very quickly and very quietly, too, because you don't want to implicate the wrong food item or the wrong producer. So you're trying to take great care to get it right. Let's dive into that a little bit more. So Liz and I have been talking about FISMA 204. It's very near and dear to Liz. I kind of see it from an outsider a little bit. I'm not in the day to day. I would love to get your perspective on the regulations and what you're seeing in industry. I would love to know like just a couple of big rock hot button things that either is going well, not going well, or you kind of see like that's a train wreck that's about ready to happen. Or if we just tweak this, like it'll be so much smoother for everyone. You know, I would love to get your insights. Yeah, great question, Reed. So I left FDA in August of 22 and developed a consulting practice called New Era Partners. And we joined with iFoodDS about a year ago, so January, February of last year, to provide advisory services for FISMA 204. So in the course of doing that, we have presented to hundreds and hundreds of companies to advise them up through webinars and so forth, communications about how to get started with traceability. So we created an infographic, our learn, plan, do, review methodology for how people can get started and presented to many different trade associations and working groups and so forth. And then done on-site projects. So we physically go on-site to a lot of distribution centers, manufacturers, actually out to restaurants and retail stores and actually track product as it's being done today. So we've looked at the current state of systems. So that's given us a viewpoint and our erstwhile team of food traceability advisors. We've seen a lot and we've seen the state of where systems are today. And I would say the good news is we've seen a lot of success. I've actually seen sortable spreadsheets in the wild. So I've actually seen it. It does exist. I was so shocked. I'm like, oh my God, this is a sortable spreadsheet. It lives. (laughs) So I get so excited. I'm like, oh my God, people are actually doing it. They're receiving lock codes from their suppliers. They're connecting it to outbound shipments, producing sortable spreadsheets. So it does exist. It can be done. However, high volume distribution centers, depending on how their warehouse management systems were set up and configured, are really challenged because suppliers provide, and I know this is going to shock you, not all of them absolutely provide GS1128 barcodes, perfectly formatted, perfectly readable. It's a very small minority of cases where they don't, but there are definitely those cases where people use the older standard, the ITF14, which just has a G10, so no lock code. Or they might put a UPC, or it may be just their 
SKU number or an internal number. So distribution centers have that challenge of many different formats of products coming through their DCs. And unless you have 100% the same, DCs can't use that information. I want to pause on that just for a second, because we threw out lots of acronyms and UPCs and GTINs and all that, but it really boiled down to many different formats of sharing information. That's fundamentally what it is. Many different formats of sharing information, which I think a lot of folks is like, yeah, so what's the problem with that? I like to take, you know, everyday folks and be like, well, that's like every delivery that comes to your house is in a different language. Hebrew, Arabic, Chinese, Mandarin, Hindu, and it goes on and on and on and on. You can decipher it, but it just takes time. And depending upon what resources you have, it could take a lot of time. Now let's layer on top. It's your four-year-old child. They're sick. They just broke out in hives. They're throwing up. They have 104 fever. That's really what we're talking about here. I mean, it's food safety and we can live without food for a while, without water for less while, but we all need it. And it's much more serious than we think. We really, I think as an everyday public in the United States, we take for granted grocery stores just on a very daily basis. And I just hope that settles in for folks because this is like, it's not trivial and it's complicated. It's so complicated. And Andy's talking about these high volume distribution centers. If you think about all of those shipments that they're getting in from their suppliers, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. Then they send it to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of customers. It's crazy, but it's all food and it needs to be handled safely. And then FISMA 204 is that additional record keeping so that when you do have an issue, you can more quickly get to the guts of that information. Right, Andy? I mean, that's like the basis of FISMA 204. Yeah, exactly. The traceability lock code and the source. Where was something made and what was the lock code? Because from the lock code, you can figure out the ingredients, who was on the production line that day, where was it produced? If it's a initial packer, you can figure out which fields it came from. If you're first land-based receiver, what vessels it came from, where did that come from? Like that's really what it comes down to is where did this product come from that got me sick? Connecting those dots to the source is really important because most foodborne illness, the contamination comes from the process where it's made, where it's harvested, where it's packed. It doesn't come in transit. That's typically not where food barnillas comes from. It's typically a systematic problem at a manufacturing facility, at a farm. So getting to those physical locations as quickly as possible with kind of a date range and knowing which product. So it's this particular commodity, not that particular commodity is really important for those commodity groups and for the investigators. So yeah, that basic information, who produced it, where they produce it, when did they produce it, and the ingredients that went into it or the fields that were harvested that went into it. That's the core of the rule. I have a very random question because you talked about fields, processing, not so much transit. I mean, it's either been contaminated or the contamination is just about to start and germinate or whatever it may be. But timing is really important here. Have you ever run into a situation where, hey, we have this contamination, we think It's either this facility or this location, but it was cleaned up. There's no longer evidence. And then a month later, it happens again. And you're like, man, have you run into that? Yeah, and that's pretty common because there are periodic clean outs. So sometimes if you go into a facility, you know, it's been cleaned up. It's hard to swab and detect the pathogen. It may come back, but sometimes it's hard. You have to catch it at that point in time. So a good example is at the end of a growing season in a particular region, if product is shipped out of that farm or field, you can't do the trace back until three or four or five weeks later, that field's empty. The equipment's gone. The crew's moved on to a different region. It's tumbleweeds. I mean, there's nothing to look at. So the quicker you can get out there, the more likely you still have active operations going on. So it's super important. That's why traceback investigations, they try and shrink the time. So part of the rule and the estimates on the rule is an average outbreak investigation takes 35 days. And the goal with the rule is to get it down to six. So if you can shrink it from 35 to six, the odds that that field is still in production or that packing house is still in production or the situation that was causing the problem at that manufacturing facility is still there a week later. A month later, it may not be there. Equipment can get moved out. It can 
be broken down, cleaned up. So that situation may have disappeared and you've lost the window to find the source of contamination. And then you have no idea. So there's most outbreak investigations, they don't actually find the source of contamination because of that. And also, if you can get it down to six days, then there may be the possibility of getting some of this fresh food off of the shelves at grocery stores, right? Because 35 days, it's gone. Right. Fresh items, shelf life of a couple of weeks, it's gone. Yeah. So this is both finding out where the issue started and getting potentially contaminated products off the shelf. I mean, that's huge. Andy, you mentioned BT, which I'm assuming is the Bioterrorism Act. What is the difference between BT? And FSMA. Yeah, so the BT Act was created in 2002 and started enforcement in 2004. They call it the one up, one back rule. So it is primarily what food you received, who did you receive it from, and then who did you send it to. And there's kind of a recommendation that if you're a manufacturer, that you provide the lock code. But in terms of providing that information to the subsequent recipient, it's not part of the rule. So the BT Act doesn't have data sharing. So interoperability is not part of that rule. Whereas FISMA 204, part of the rule is shipping KDEs have to be supplied to the subsequent recipient. KDEs. Key data elements. There you go. <laughs> yep. So the key data elements have to be provided to the subsequent recipient. So that creates and drives a need for interoperability. So that's where, you know, back to the high volume distribution center, they're reliant on their suppliers to send those key data elements forward about the traceability lock code and the source, provide that information to those distribution centers in a way that they can receive it quickly and efficiently. So that's where the BT Act, it didn't require data sharing. So lock codes could literally change at every point in the supply chain. If we go back to the BT Act, that's kind of like an outcome of the 9-11 situation and where we were going. And again, before iPhones and those types of things. And now the data sharing is you know, a lot better. We really take for granted. I mean, I remember 2002 very visibly, but that's 22 years ago. It's a generation. A lot has changed. It's very interesting. So it's nice to see that the FISMA 204 really kind of rolls on top of that and just kind of takes it to that next level. So with that being said, what is your perspective of the part that GS1 standards play with adopting and achieving compliance or helping in any way, shape, or form with FISMA 204? You think about those past 20 years. So when the BT Act was proposed, originally they had lock code, but some of the comments and the reason why lock code was taken out is it wasn't feasible. Like industry didn't have the technology or the skills to do lock code traceability up and down the supply chain. Over the past 20 years, the work that's been done with GS1 and industry groups like the Produce Traceability Initiative, some of the work that was done beginning in 2008 with PTI, even before FISMO was signed into law, working on identifying cases, digitizing records, capturing the information, sharing it with tools like EPCIS. Over the past 20 years, all those technologies have been developed and refined and improved so that different organizations can now communicate with each other, lock code information, traceability information, and EPCIS has evolved to where it's being broadly adopted by like the seafood industry for interoperability. It's now part of the standards for FISMA 204. So the FISMA 204 working group from GS1 just released guidance incorporating EPCIS and EDI together as parallel options for how you might share those KDEs with each other. So that evolution of technology, EDI has been around a long time, like longer than you read, I think. So yeah, it's only it's, by like two years. <laughs> <laughs> so EPCIS is the new kid on the block and provides a lot more information, a lot more efficient way of sharing data. And you can describe all of the critical tracking events and key data elements. So that technology is going to enable like the next generation of interoperability and traceability. It's going to take time. I mean, no doubt. Like 
it's a big industry and there's a lot of work that still needs to go on. But at least if you have that common framework that you can work towards, it creates like FISMA 204. When we talk about it in 10 years, it's going to be a non-issue because right now people don't complain about how much it costs to do the Bioterrorism Act of 2002. They right. did. When they started, the just like anything else, right? Just sure. like, you got to wear a seatbelt, no drinking and driving. I love watching those old commercials, like no smoking yeah. indoors. When it first starts, the world is ending. And technology gets better and cheaper over time. So yep. just like when I started doing traceability with the Windows CE devices instead of iPhone and Android, it was really expensive to do data capture. Now it's not. And so 10 years from now, the technology would be so much better that really, you know, the things that we're worried about today will be handled. And so we'll be on to the next set of challenges, I'm sure. And so, okay, organizations kind of need to do traceability or FISMA 204 compliance because of regulation. But it sounds like there's a lot of things that they're going to be doing, investing in technology, potentially infrastructure, but getting their data together. I'm assuming, and tell me if I'm right here, that there's other benefits beyond compliance. And not just in the next couple of years, but as technology moves forward, have you thought about, and I'm sure you have, because beyond compliance can be three years from now if you're ahead of the game. What other benefits could there be beyond just the traceability stuff? There's a couple different benefits I've seen, especially after going through the COVID-19 experience at FDA, watching supply chains melt down, being able to dynamically respond to challenges in the food supply chain is incredibly important. So resilience, being able to rewire supply chains dynamically, which means you've got to have visibility in real time across your entire supply chain and across different supply chains that don't necessarily interact with each other. Because what we saw was all of a sudden food service melted down, like no one was going to restaurants. So there was all these food items that were produced to restaurant spec that had to get rewired through the retail. Not single package consumer use. Exactly. So that transition was tough. Technology helped aid it. But can you imagine if you actually had lot level traceability and vision? You could see your inventory. You could see what products are where and where they need to move. And you could rewire different supply chains because you have interoperability. So if everyone's using EPCIS and can share their inventory back and forth, you can change who you're doing business with almost instantly just by a couple clicks. So now that rewiring wouldn't have taken six to eight weeks. It could have been done much faster because people end up plowing good food under because they had no outlet to sell it. Right. Yeah. We all saw the whole, Hey, let's pour the milk down the drain instead of, cause it went to schools. And those are single use items that we could have put in the grocery stores, but because of the way it was identified, we couldn't seamlessly take it in. Absolutely. Yeah. Selling a whole bunch of those little tiny little milk containers to a consumer that wants like a two gallon container. Yeah. That's not as efficient. So yeah. Liz and I have talked about this before and, you know, in my home dinner conversations, the kids sometimes will ask questions. Most of the time they don't because they're teenagers, but food service and grocery, they're very, very similar and very, very different all in the same breath. I said to my kids, I'm like, the closest you get to this experience is going to Costco. And they're like, what are you talking about? I'm like, well, sometimes we go to Costco and there's that massive jar of ketchup. And for a family of five, that works well. But for a family of two, that's like a lifetime supply. And I said, that's food service versus grocery. And they're like, oh, I'm like, yeah, but you know, anyway, I would be interested in your opinion, changing gears just slightly, because we've also been talking about the use of 2D barcodes, right? The most common one out there today is QR code. And everyone's familiar with them. So we're seeing the use of 2D barcodes and we've been pushing Sunrise 2027, which is the start of use of 2D at retail. We're also talking about digital receipts and having this platform to have the information in. And there's pros and cons to all these types of things. But I'm interested in your opinion of how this relates to food safety. Does it come into play or does it not? Absolutely. And I think having Sunrise 2027, FISMA 204, it really is moving us in the direction of convergence between point of sale information and supply chain information. You can see those things connecting and the user interface for that would be the digital receipt. So when a consumer right now gets a paper receipt, they can't do much with it. But if you get a digital receipt that includes hyperlinks to those products, that allows you to potentially reorder them 
I mean, basically people have the same 15, 20 items in their shopping cart every week. Having that information in a digital fashion where you can store it in like a reorder app so you can reorder that again. That's a simple example. But if you had the lock code, now you can provide lock code level response. So you can give a thumbs up, thumbs down based on the quality of that product. So now deep down in the supply chain, if you connect the supply chain data to the POS data, people deep in the supply chain can get consumer feedback, which is really hard to do right now. And from a public health perspective, if consumers have that lock code level information pushed into their phone, into an app that they have, when they're interviewed by CDC, when they have a foodborne illness, they could actually provide the information on their own application, their own consumer app and say, well, these are the products I bought over the past two or three weeks. And maybe even here are the lock codes for some of them. So now if they had lock code at their fingertips, that's kind of game changing for outbreak investigations because now you're not going through the records of the distributor and the broker and the, this person and that person, the consumer would know. This is either the date code or the lock code of the product that I bought. And they would have it automatically being populated so they don't have to do a secondary operation like scanning QR codes. The QR code is scanned at POS, it gets added to the digital receipt. And what they have is digital receipt app. So they have all that information either in their credit card or in a separate app, a health app. So a lot of people collect that information for health reasons. They would have allergens, they'd have nutrition information, they'd have supply, again, reordering the foods that they like. They could gravitate, especially in the commodity food world, they could identify brewer packer shippers that they like, which would be great. So the PLUs, which are totally undifferentiated right now, you could actually segment and say, this particular type of produce is being better received by consumers than this type. But right now it's all shielded because it's PLUs. And for those that don't know, PLU? Product lookup. So yeah, it is the four or five digit code that you spend hours at the self-checkout trying to oh, find. Yeah. They've yep. gotten so much better at it. So much better at that. <laughs> it was terrifying to have, wait, you want me to get produce? But it's self-checkout. It's self I'm not getting produce. I'm not getting produce. <laughs> and a lot of shrink comes from those PLU codes because you can change the PLU number to the non-organic from the organic and you get a discount. So yeah. people have figured out that game too. So yeah, right. definitely moving more towards a 2D barcode on those products that could really be consumed by the POS would be advantageous for a lot of different reasons. What you just explained feels like Google lookup capabilities, Google search capabilities for everything we're consuming. Absolutely. Eating. Reed and I have two questions that we ask all of our guests at the end of our recording. I get to ask you the first one. I can't wait to hear what you're going to say. So personal life, work life, what is the favorite technology that you're using right now? My favorite technology right now is, and this is like a pet peeve of mine from working with many different companies, is the receipts from traveling are the worst. Like keeping track of all those little paper slips and speaking of digital receipts, like you get a lot of paper. And what I love about my iPhone right now is when you bring up the notes app and scan one of those receipts and put it in your notes app, and then it will digitize all the text. So it makes it searchable. Coolest thing ever. So when I'm trying to find the receipt from that trip to Florida or whatever, I can just type in Miami and on my phone, it will find all those pictures of receipts from Miami because it digitizes all the text. It just kind of did it and didn't make a big deal out of it, which I love about iPhones. It's like a new feature will pop up. They won't even tell you about it. It's incredible. So that's one of my favorite things now is like digitizing the text in my notes app. I love that. Yeah. I just use the notes app to remind myself where I parked the car when I go to the airport because I'll hit three of them in a week. <laughs> That's a nice little tip. I appreciate the simplicity. And I am literally, I have a stack of receipts in front of me right now that have to get done. They're like two weeks behind. The question I have for you is what is something throughout your life that just hit you? Like it made you pause and it just blew your mind and you started looking at the world differently from that moment on. I think the thing that opened up my mind the most is honestly doing the seafood traceability project. Because working primarily in the U.S., it gave me visibility into all the amazing ideas and technology that was being developed around the world. 
So I think we have a tendency to focus on like the innovation engines here in the US, but getting out on the road and seeing the amazing things that were going on in Bangkok and Bali and Portugal and places like that. So I realized like we're in this little bubble, information bubble, and we just see what we see here in the US. So if you're working on a problem or you're thinking about how do I do something differently, it's really good to expand that lens and some of the opportunities I've had with GS1 is going to like the global meetings. So there you're exposed to, what is it, 109, 110 member organizations? 14 this year. It's incredible. Like I always come away from that event just blown away at all the cool things that are going on around the world. And I had a chance to visit a bunch of the member organizations while I was doing seafood traceability because we made a point. We went to the country. We tried to go visit the MO. So like if you're traveling, you just want to see what's going on in that country. The GS1 member organizations are like the honeybees of traceability technology. So they know what's going on. So you go reach out to that office and they're great. They're super friendly. You can show up and they'll tell you what's going on in that country. And I think it's a really underutilized resource when people are doing global projects, especially with traceability. Because the MOs, they're the ones that are exposed to all the questions and the hard things. So definitely encourage people, like, do a road trip, see your local MO when you're in a different country. It's definitely worth it. Yeah, and what Andy's referring to with MOs are member organizations. GS1 is actually a federated organization. So there's GS1 US, which Liz and I work for, and then there's GS1 Canada, and there's GS1 Mexico, and GS1 Germany, and... GS1 Japan and so on down the line, there's about 114 and it's because every country has its own different rules and regulations. So that's really cool to see how you are leveraging the system, the global system and connecting it and using it as jump off points. And it's really cool. Well, Andy, one, thank you for the time today. Thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. And two, I think I can say this on behalf of Liz too, but Thank you for the work that you do in the industry. I can see the challenges. We do see the challenges and nothing's perfect, but it's got to be really rewarding when things come together and driving from 35 days to six days. And then the next iteration of that, getting it to like a day, getting it to within hours. So thank you for that. Appreciate it. Absolutely. And I'd be remiss if I didn't set the Frank Giannis goal of 2.2 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you for the opportunity to be part of the podcast, Reed and Liz, and I look forward to working with you on getting it down to 2.2 seconds. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Next Level Supply Chain with GS1 US. If you enjoyed today's show, please subscribe to our feed and explore more great episodes wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to share and follow us on social media. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.